All right, we're continuing to work through different types of hi higher criticism. The previous lecture was about form criticism, which was the original method that then received a name as other methods developed. This time we're looking at redaction criticism, lecture 12, and you'll see that it is not uh, very complicated, even though the name seems unfamiliar. Let's remind ourselves again, higher criticism is looking at sources and processes. And this time, we're going to focus very much on the author. So, redaction criticism developed out of form critique in the 1950s. And it still keeps the focus on the Gospels and Acts, especially because redaction switches the attention to the, the decisions of the author. The author is seen as a redactor, or we would more normally say in English, an editor of the existing material. So if you go back to our definition, how did the author take the material, the information, combine it and edit it. It's not so much about the sources this time, although we will talk about sources very much here, but, but how did that author then take the available material and form it into the final document? <clears throat> so redaction, yeah, I just said that. Redaction criticism is the study of how the author took the information available combined it, and modified it in order to shape the final document. If you've studied the Gospels and Acts, you know that they are not just history books, but that they have agendas, that each author is trying to demonstrate something about Jesus, and that causes the author to make certain decisions. Um, for example, Luke uses Mark as his framework, so he's pretty much following the, the order that Mark wrote things in. But of course, it's Luke is much bigger than Mark. So Luke adds in material that he has available to him that maybe Mark didn't have. Uh, and he focuses very much on material about the Holy Spirit, material about Jesus reaching out to the poor and to children and to women. Very similarly, but with a different agenda, Matthew uses Mark as his framework. And we'll see a little evidence of this when we, when we look at our last example. But he is interested, while Luke is probably writing to Gentiles, Matthew is almost certainly writing to Jews. And he wants to show the Jewish people that Jesus fulfills their expectations for Messiah, which is sometimes portrayed by them as the new Moses, because God promised he would send another prophet like Moses. So Matthew pulls out all the stops in searching for parallels between the two stories of Jesus and Moses, particularly in the birth stories and the announcements uh, and things like that, so that, for example, both Moses and Jesus end up in Egypt. Now watch, if, remember we talked about how we don't have any evidence that the gospel or New Testament writers are inventing stories about Jesus. If Matthew was going to invent a story about Jesus, because he wants to show that Jesus is the new Moses, what would he have done? Would, would, he would have created stories that are parallel to Moses and almost identical. But no, he doesn't create stories. He goes looking for parallels that already exist so that while Moses was born in Egypt and had to flee a, a, a monarch who was killing babies in Egypt, Jesus is under a monarch who is killing babies in Palestine. And whether it's just Jerusalem, just Bethlehem, it's not so sure, but he's killing babies in Palestine, and he has to flee to Egypt. So Matthew sees those as very important parallels, but he doesn't try to make Jesus' story match up to Moses' story, and that happens all the way through. 
So just a little bit of apologetics there. Now, uh, I've already assumed something that we maybe should say out loud. Most scholars accept, and not all, and some very good scholars do not accept this, but I go from this assumption that Mark was the first gospel written and that Luke and Matthew have access to Mark's gospel. They start with it. They make it the framework for what they are going to produce, and then they add other material, some of which they have individually, so that Luke's unique material is called the L material, Matthew's unique material is called the M material, but they also have some material that both of them have, such as the Beatitudes, and that's called Q material, which comes from the German word Kvelle, which means source. So they, they get, Matthew and Luke get some of their material from the same source. But what I'd like us to look at here is material that all three Gospels have, but they treat it differently. And, and we talked about Matthew's agenda, Luke's agenda, how they add to Mark in order to follow their agenda. But sometimes they are just simply concerned to improve Mark's grammar or his word choice or his syntax. Mark's gospel appears to have been written very quickly in, under some sort of pressure, or perhaps Mark just wasn't as literarily trained. In any case, there's parts of Mark that are awkward or even off-putting. And Matthew and Luke often make adjustments in word choice in order to improve on Mark. So what I'd like you to do is to, to stop the video right here and look up these three passages. I will read them in a minute, but I would like you to read them first, preferably in a literal translation and preferably uh, very carefully. So look at them very carefully. Think for yourself, oh, look at the differences here. Notice them, and then I will talk you through them in a minute. So turn it off. All right, we are back. And I will read from these passages first, and then we will uh, go to the last slide where I make a, a sort of a graphic comparison of them. So first of all, Mark 4, 38, this is about Jesus being in the boat with the disciples. And it says there's a storm that comes up and he himself, reading from the old NASB, which I find to be better than the newer ones, he himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And being aroused, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you so timid? How is it that you have no faith? Well, Matthew would have had Mark and would have read the way that Mark described this incident and if it is the Apostle Matthew, he was actually there. So he, he may make a change for that reason. But remember also that the interaction between Jesus and his disciples happened in Aramaic. And all three authors are writing in Greek. So there's also reasons that the translations are different into Greek. But also that some of the way that Mark wrote is a little bit bothersome. And let me show you my last slide so you can see. Mark had teacher, don't you care? And Jesus says they have no faith, right? A hostile reader could have seen this passage as showing the disciples being very disrespectful to Jesus. Don't you care that we're dying? And Jesus grumping back at them that they have no faith. Well, Matthew wants to clean this up a little bit. So what does he say? Now we are in Matthew 8, starting in verse 25. The storm's arising, and they came to him and awoke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you timid, you men of little faith? 
And then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. So instead of calling him teacher, they call him Lord, which is a higher designation. Remember, it was originally spoken in Aramaic, not in Greek. Instead of saying, don't you care? They, they reach out for salvation. They ask him to save them. Jesus doesn't say they have no faith. He says they have little faith, which is still a bit of a rebuke, but it's a little better. Luke gets a look at Mark as he's writing his gospel and does not make the same changes that Matthew does, which is good evidence that Matthew and Luke worked independently and that this is a passage that each of them found in Mark and adjusted, but adjusted differently. So Luke says, and we're now in chapter 8, verse 24, And they came to him and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And being aroused, he rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped, and it became calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? So Luke also gives Jesus a higher designation in the mouth of the disciples, Master, Master. And instead of saying, don't you care, he shows them saying, we're perishing. And instead of saying they have no faith, Jesus says, where is your faith? As if he expects them to have it. So there's quite a difference there. Now, just for synoptic studies, there's also this very interesting thing that happens here. Matthew and Luke both have this story that they derived from Mark, and it's at almost the exact same spot in their gospel. Now, of course, the chapter and verse numbers were done much later, but they were done in a fairly regular pattern. And sure enough, these two, these two gospels have this story in just about the same spot showing that they're following the framework of Mark. All right, well, that was Redaction Criticism. I look forward to talking to you again about historical criticism.